What is a dog man? Is it the same as a werewolf? Well, sort of. But what if werewolves aren't people that turn into wolves under a full moon like the legend suggests? Maybe they aren't shapeshifters at all. What if they were always part dog and part human? Even when the moon isn't full, but we just use that fable to explain something that we don't understand. Keep in mind, the dogman isn't a new discovery. In fact, ancient civilizations have revered them and in some cases, treated them as gods. That brings us to this question. Were all the werewolf legends merely a way for our ancestors to rationalize the existence of dogman? Could it be that these creatures have always roamed the earth, living alongside humans for centuries, only to be misinterpreted as werewolves because of our lack of understanding? The dogman has gained considerable attention in recent years, thanks to numerous alleged sightings and encounters, and of course, the internet. Descriptions of the creature often include a humanoid body covered in hair with features of a wolf or dog. Typically, it is seen standing upright on two legs and displaying an unsettling mix of human and canine traits. These characteristics seem to align with the werewolf myth, but there are some key differences between the two. Unlike the werewolf, the dogman is said to maintain its hybrid form at all times, rather than transforming under specific conditions such as a full moon. This subtle yet significant distinction may indicate that dogman is not merely a shapeshifter, but rather a distinct species altogether. One that has coexisted with humans for millennia. Throughout history, there are records of various ancient civilizations that have encountered and interacted with dog-like beings. Some of these creatures were worshipped as deities, while others were respected for their strength, wisdom, and ferocity in battles. These accounts suggest that the dogman may have been an integral part of human history long before modern folklore and pop culture brought it to the forefront. As we examine the stories of Anubis, werewolves, and cynocephali, we begin to see a pattern emerging, a tapestry of interconnected myths and legends that span across cultures, continents, and time periods. Could it be that these tales are not merely legends, but rather glimpses into the hidden reality, one in which humans and dogmen have shared the earth since the dawn of time. It forces us to question the line between myth and reality, and to consider the possibility that our ancestors had far greater insight into the world around them than we may have previously believed. As we explore the history and what we know of dogman and its potential connections to ancient civilizations, we must approach the subject with an open mind, embracing the notion that there are more to these legends than meets the eye. After all, we're still finding traces of advanced civilizations that scientists never knew existed. Now there's masses of material in the series about the possibility of a lost civilization and presenting the evidence for a lost civilization. Um, but, but ultimately, when you talk of a lost civilization, how did it become lost? Our investigation into the history of Dogman begins in ancient Egypt, where we encounter Anubis, the god of the afterlife and protector of tombs. Anubis is often depicted with the body of a man and the head of a jackal or dog. The striking resemblance to the modern-day Dogman raises intriguing questions about their potential connection. The image of Anubis may have served as a source of inspiration for the dogman's appearance in various stories, stemming from the ancient Egyptian beliefs and the reverence for the god. Jackals were known to frequent grave sites in Egypt, leading to the association between Anubis and the afterlife. Similarly, the dogman has been reported to inhabit remote, 
wooded areas, often associated with an air of mystery and isolation, but also protection. Anubis held a unique place in ancient Egyptian society, as he was responsible for ensuring the proper mummification process and safeguarding tombs from grave robbers. The jackal's scavenger-like behavior likely contributed to its association with Anubis and the afterlife, as the gods served to protect the dead from desecration of their resting places. There is no doubt that by exploring Anubis's rich history, we will begin to uncover a wealth of cultural connections and insights that may offer a new perspective of the dogman phenomenon. While it's essential to remain skeptical and discerning, we cannot dismiss the possibility that these stories and legends of the past may contain hidden truths about the mysterious dogman. In fact, you may remember that the Egyptians would weigh the hearts of the deceased against a feather to determine what happens to them in the afterlife. The weighing of the heart ceremony was considered to be one of the most important parts of the journey into the netherworld after death, as it determined whether the soul would be allowed to pass into the afterlife or be devoured by the monster Amiot. But what you may have never realized, Anubis played a vital role in the ancient Egyptian concept of judgment. The dogman god himself was said to weigh the heart of the deceased against the feather of truth, determining their eligibility for the afterlife. This aspect of Anubis mythology may have influenced the portrayal of the dogman as a creature that seems to straddle the line between the natural and supernatural realms. So you can see that the history of Anubis takes us on a fascinating journey that weaves together threads of myth and legend into history. As we venture further into the world of Dogman, we turn our attention to werewolves. Shape-shifting beings that have haunted human imagination for centuries. We tend to frame our perception of truth based on what we know from our lifetime of experiences. And werewolves may have more to them than just ancient folklore and modern movie villains. The werewolf originates from a variety of sources, with tales of humans transforming into wolves appearing in many ancient cultures. The Greeks told stories of the cursed King Lycon, who was transformed into a wolf by the gods as punishment for his wickedness. The Norsemen spoke of berserkers, fierce warriors who would don wolf pelts and channel the ferocity of wolves in battle. These early werewolf legends laid the groundwork for the modern interpretation we know today. The werewolf's shape-shifting nature is typically associated with lunar cycles, with transformations occurring during the full moon. In contrast, the dogman is believed to be a constant hybrid of man and canine. Despite the difference, both creatures share a common thread of a human-canine hybrid, which may suggest a shared origin or common inspiration in ancient legends. As werewolf legends spread across Europe in the early days, they evolved to incorporate elements of local folklore and beliefs. In France, tales of Loup Garou, a vicious werewolf, terrorized the countryside. In Germany, the Werwolf blended werewolf lore with local superstitions, creating a complex and frightening figure. Throughout history, though, werewolf legends have been used to explain the unexplained. It's worth noting that werewolves have been used as a scapegoat during times of social unrest and upheaval. In the late Middle Ages, werewolf trials were held mirroring those of the famous witch trials of Salem. These werewolf trials were primarily held in Europe, with many occurring in France, Germany, and Switzerland. The trials were often sparked by reports of mysterious animal attacks, unexplained deaths, or strange behavior in people. Belief in the werewolves, or lycanthropy, 
involves the idea that humans could transform into wolves or wolf-like creatures and subsequently commit violent acts. This historical context offers insight into the human tendency to create myths and legends to cope with unknown or unexplainable things. Could it be that tales of werewolves and the dogmen are intertwined, both inspired by ancient cultural beliefs and real-world encounters with these elusive creatures? Furthermore, the werewolf's ability to transform and adapt to different cultures and times may offer clues to the dogman's presence in our collective imagination. As we continue our exploration of the dogman and its origins with tales of humans with canine features, we encounter Cynocephali, a fascinating group of dog-headed humanoids. These beings have been described in various ancient texts and stories, suggesting their widespread influence on human culture in those times. The Sinocephali, which translates to dog-headed in Greek, were believed to be a race of people with bodies of humans and heads of dogs. Their existence has been documented in numerous ancient writings, including those of the Greek physician Tizius and the Roman geographer Strabo. These accounts provide intriguing glimpses into Sinocephali's role in the mythology and folklore of different cultures. Tizius described the Sinocephali as inhabitants of the mountains of India, characterized by their ferocity and incredible speed. They were said to communicate through barks and howls and live off the land hunting animals and consuming raw meat. Strabo, on the other hand, mentioned the Sinocephali in his accounts of Scythians, a nomadic people who lived in the region of the modern-day Ukraine and Russia. The Sinocephali also appear in Christian text, most notably in the story of St. Christopher, the patron saint of travelers. According to the legend, St. Christopher was a Sinocephalus who converted to Christianity and was ultimately martyred for his faith. Despite their varied representations, the Sinocephali share certain similarities with the dogman and werewolves. The blending of human and canine features is a common thread that runs through these legends, suggesting a deep-rooted fascination with the idea of human-animal hybrids. This fascination may stem from our innate curiosity about the unknown natural world and the boundaries that separate us from other creatures. In examining the myths and stories surrounding Sinocephali, we gain a deeper understanding of how different cultures have attempted to make sense of the world around them by weaving together elements of the natural and the supernatural. And this next story is no exception. When I first heard this story, I couldn't wait to share it with you. It makes me wonder how many people experience something like this and never tell a soul. Well, thankfully for us, Tom and Cindy did share their encounter. And now I'm going to share it with you. Tell me in the comments what you think they found in the woods. So let's get into it. Tom and Cindy had been excited for weeks to go bear hunting on a friend's property in southwest Pennsylvania, relatively close to Ohio Powell State Park. They heard stories of big black bears in the remote woods in that area and they couldn't wait to see what they would find on their hunt. They planned their trip carefully to maximize the three days they were spending there and set up camp on a friend's property near the town of Turkey Foot. There were no buildings on the property, so camping was the only option other than a very expensive resort about 30 to 40 minutes away in the Laurel Highlands. The first day started well. Cindy had set up her tree stand near a creek bed that had plenty of signs of bear and game trails. She was confident that from this spot, she would get a good shot at a bear, and she'd brought her favorite rifle with her to make sure. But as the day wore on, she began to notice that something seemed off. This was the perfect spot for wildlife, but the woods seemed way quieter than usual. Cindy tried to push those feelings aside and focus on the different angles and vantage points she had from her tree stand but she couldn't shake the sense that something was watching her. At one point while she was scouting, she noticed some movement down by the bend in the creek. It was a subtle movement, 
but she was pretty dialed in for any signs of wildlife, and it was right in the tree line near the creek. Whatever it was never came out from the trees for Cindy to get a good look at it. But at first, she was pretty confident it was a bear, and that got her excited. After a bit, she started to think, however, that it might not be a bear. She didn't know why, but she felt like this thing was, well, smarter than your average bear. She could barely make out a face of the animal from about 150 to 200 yards away. It definitely had a snout, but it wasn't blundering around and looking for food like a bear. This thing stayed right where it was and looked right at her like it was watching her. Or more accurately, what she said, spying on her from the cover of the trees. For what seemed like a minute or more, it was looking directly at her. Although it was hard to tell from that far away, it looked like it was staring right into her eyes. She even thought about how you're not supposed to challenge an animal by making eye contact. She looked away for a second to make sure that she had her sidearm with her, even though she knew she did. And when she looked back up, it was gone. And at that point, so was she. Cindy didn't waste any time getting the hell out of there. She climbed down the tree stand and went back to camp as fast as possible. She was debating to even say anything to Tom about it. She didn't know what to say to him to describe it because it sounded so far-fetched. And Tom is a huge skeptic. Nothing gets him rattled and he always has some rational explanation for everything. So when Tom asked Cindy if she saw anything, she just said, yeah, some tracks and possibly a bear in the trees that didn't come out. She knew in her heart that that was a gross understatement of how she felt, but she wasn't about to get into it at that moment. That night, as they were settling into their tent after eating a few bags of dehydrated spaghetti, they heard some distant howling. Cindy recalled that she must have looked really scared because Tom felt it was necessary to reassure her that it was probably just a coyote. But she wasn't convinced. She'd grown up in the woods and she knew what coyotes sounded like. This was different. It was deeper, louder, and felt somehow more menacing. As the howling grew closer, Cindy began to get a little nervous. She sat in the tent and gripped her rifle tightly and tried to steady her breathing. It went quiet for about 45 minutes or so and she thought it might be gone and finally began to calm down. Then suddenly, there was a loud rustling outside the tent. Cindy's heart raced as she realized that they might be in some real legit danger. Tom even grabbed his gun, unzipped the tent, and peered outside into the darkness. But he couldn't see anything. The howling continued, and they could hear something moving around outside. Cindy whispered, Tom, I saw something earlier. I couldn't quite make it out, but I swear it looked like a dog. Tom tried to calm her down, but he couldn't deny that the howling sounded too big and too close to be a coyote. They stayed up for hours, listening to the howling and the rustling, trying to stay calm, but in reality, they were barely hanging on. They felt trapped inside the tent. Cindy kept her eyes glued on the tent flaps, ready to shoot at the first sign of danger. Tom and Cindy sat huddled together in their tent, their hearts racing, as they heard howling grow closer and closer. But they knew that they were facing something big, and Tom said he wasn't sure how easily it would even go down if they had to shoot it up close. As the night wore on, the howling grew louder and more intense. Sometimes it was further away, and sometimes it was real close. In fact, they could hear moving outside, sniffing around the tent. They didn't dare make a sound, afraid that they might attract the creature's attention. Cindy was the first to break the silence. 
Tom? What is that? She whispered, her voice barely audible from shaking. I don't know, Tom replied, but we need to be ready for anything. They spent the rest of the night in a state of high alert, listening to the creature move around outside. They could hear it snarling and growling, and they knew that they were lucky to still be alive. Finally, at around 2 a.m., the howling and snorting stopped. The woods fell silent again, and Tom and Cindy held their breath, waiting for something to happen. But there was nothing. After hours of running on straight adrenaline and dehydrated spaghetti, and being so exhausted and terrified, they finally started to doze off. But they still didn't want to sleep. They just couldn't help it. They woke up at first light. They were both still shaken by the events of the night before and could still feel the adrenaline pumping through their veins as they relived the night in their minds. And even though they didn't want to admit it, they knew they barely got out of that situation alive. Tom ventured outside to investigate. Stay in the tent, he said. Let me look first. He scanned the ground looking for any signs of the creature. And it was then that he noticed the footprints in the dirt around an area that he peed earlier. They were large and they looked like they'd been made from something that was walking on two legs, not four. They looked like bear tracks, but more like a dog, with an elongated foot very similar to a bear, but more narrow. But this definitely wasn't a bear. Bears don't howl. Tom has been hunting bears since he was a boy. He knew the snorts and the grunts well. This wasn't a bear. It was no doubt canine in his mind. Tom felt a pit in his stomach. He knew that whatever he was dealing with was not a natural animal. It was something else entirely. Something he didn't have a name for. We need to get out of here now, he said. Cindy nodded, her eyes wide with fear. They quickly packed up their gear and loaded it into the truck, and they had the feeling like they were being watched the entire time. They didn't talk much on the four-hour drive back to civilization, both lost in their own thoughts and fears. When they finally made it back home to Newcastle, Pennsylvania, they felt a sense of relief but they also felt a sense of unease. They knew that whatever they had encountered in the woods was still out there, lurking. As they settled back into their normal lives, they tried to convince themselves that what they had seen was just their imagination. They tried to write it off as a bear or a coyote or some other animal, but deep down, they both knew what they had encountered in the woods was something far more complex and intelligent than any normal game animal. They never went back to that property, and they didn't even tell their friend about it, but they did tell us anonymously in hope of letting others know what they experienced to see if they have as well. So if you enjoyed this video, hit the like button. Thanks for watching Strange News. I'm your host, Max Huntley.